Welcome back everyone to R2Cast number 18. Today we have Claire Taylor. If you want to say hello there, Claire. Hi there. So we'll get into Claire's story as we always do. I like to cover all the boring stuff first, but uh, we're now live on Apple and Google Podcasts as well. So it's not just Spotify and YouTube and like seven others. There's 10 now it's on. So I don't know why there's so many, but you can find it everywhere. But if you're new to the channel or page or whatever, uh, make sure to jump onto Facebook and Instagram and follow Rural to Kitchen. And that will keep you updated of, of everything that's sort of coming and everything that should be happening. And if you want to have some kind of input, like uh, Wallace needs to shave his beard off or whatever, just let me know and get in touch over there and subscribe on YouTube. But moving on from that, uh, I believe it was Michael Scott that said, my how the turntables about a year ago, Claire uh, featured me in The Scottish Farmer and uh, really sort of boosted R2K to, maybe not where it is today, but certainly gave it a massive boost at the time, uh, which I'm very much appreciative before. But then about a month later, I did an interview with her, wrote a post about her, put it on Facebook, and then here we are as number 18 on the podcast. So, Claire, enough of me talking a load of nonsense and trying to sound like I'm a good journalist like yourself. Um, could you tell us a bit about yourself, maybe about a background, that sort of thing? <laughs> okay, where to begin? Um, so I grew up in the, the southwest coast of Scotland, just outside Ayr. My family have got a small holding and we've got belted Galloway cattle. Um, my, we still have the family home um, there now, but I, I left 17, went off to university in Edinburgh and then did various things I'm sure we'll get on to sort of different career paths. It wasn't quite where I thought it was going to end up, but um, I then ended up moving back to Glasgow. And in the last two months, I've just moved house with my partner to a wee cottage in Fenwick, so a little rural village. I'm back to my Ayrshire roots. <laughs> it, it is the best county, isn't it? I mean, uh, we can't can't disagree with that. And I think the best thing about your old house, Claire, was the fact it had a view of Aaron. Um, yeah. <laughs> views on to Aaron, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful place. Um, yeah, so what was, was that right in saying your mum was a vet and also your gran was a vet? Is that right? Was yeah. that ever in the best of years? <laughs> yeah, so I sort of broke the, the female tradition in the family. So, yeah, my granny was a vet at Liverpool and, and she was one of, I think she was one of the first vets at the time in the UK, to first female vets. And then my mum went on to become a vet and they actually worked at the same practice, Collier and Brock, in the air for many years together. Um, my mum sort of gave up practicing a few years ago. Um, I wasn't maybe gifted scientifically. My mum says I, I use it as an excuse, but I wasn't. And um, my, my interests were always slightly more sort of political and, and language. And that was sort of my sh strength at school. So I'd always sort of wanted to pursue more of sort of modern studies and politics. And that was kind of where I was going. But I was still very involved at home because my dad's got a kennels and cattery, still runs the kennels and catteries. It's not been obviously as great during during COVID. We've not been busy, but um, we've, they've had that business now for gosh, 35 years upwards. Um, so I've always sort of been helping out in my summers and throughout the year, early mornings, both on the, on the farm with the cattle, but also in, in the kennels and cattery. Did a bit of, bit of accounts going up as well. Mum thought it would give me a bit of a more well-rounded upbringing if I could do the math side too. So yeah, <laughs> it was all hands on deck at home with my, my older brother as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and as you're probably already learning from Claire, there's there's about 9 million pursuits she's, she's tried and we will get into all them. Um, so veterinary wasn't for yourself, helping certainly in the kennels and the cattery was, was part of it, but maybe not the sort of long-term goal. Uh, but before we get into all your intentions there, Claire, and, and where you ended up and that sort of thing, um, could you tell us about the Belties? I know you're, you're a bit of an advocate for Belted Galloways. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we've got um, Belted Galloway cattle, which I believe are now growing a lot more in popularity in recent years. They're, they're a native breed to Scotland they're recognized by their their lovely woolly black coats with the, the white belt around the middle and they originally came from sort of Dumfries and Galloway area and it was actually there was a lady called um, Lady Flora Stewart so she lived at Mockram, Mockram Estate down in Wigtonshire and she actually um, she was sort of one of my sort of heroes of in Belta Galloways and we had a few Belties from her growing up and she really helped my mum moving into Belties. My, my grand did and my granny who's a vet she had Belties too but my mum sort of expanded her herd over the years and you've got some really beautiful cattle and they're just great because they're so hardy I mean they're great mothers like they're easy to work with a lot of people say they're not easy to work with I guess if it's you domesticate them or not mine are very domesticated I think the way it works with my mum because she tends to do it on her own so everybody's halter trained when they're very young and they're well handled and 
they're just really good to work with. But I think a lot of Belties that you see the sort of classic shots are out on, on ranging on the hills and they can really um, convert like really poor grazing into fantastic beef. So you can you can leave them out on, you know, heather and all sorts of rough terrain. So you can get the sort of really wild Belties or we've got slightly more um, different sort of an air, the kind of ground that we have here. It's very wet as well. So they're inside a bit more than we'd like, but um, it's great because you really get to have a relationship with them and actually over the pandemic I went home for six months and um it was amazing in my 20s going back to live with my parents it was, it was a bit odd but I um, absolutely loved it and I was so involved for the first time since I was at school and I was able to like have that batch of calves that year and help halter them and bring them on so it was actually really special to be back involved for quite a number of months and help out my parents which was good. No, I mean, I, I can kind of sort of mirror that. I, if I say I came back home, I've basically never left, but uh, I, I came back for the sort of COVID time as well, and it was quite nice to fully get involved. I've always been doing work on the farm and stuff, but to actually get a, a, an almost year of, of straight being involved was, was quite good. And um, if for, for people listening that maybe maybe aren't familiar with farming or, or certainly beef cattle in general, look up Belty Galleys on Google to see what they look, at, look like. They're called Belty Galloway for a reason. The best description I can sort of give at the minute is if you look at them side on, they look like a tarmac road with a line down the middle. Um, <laughs> is, I don't know, it just seems to be the easiest way in my head to understand it, but the best way is to have, go and have a look at them. Well, people call them o Oreo castle. I think in, in America, they're often called Oreo, I guess, because of the black and, and the white yeah. in the middle. I think it was like Robert P Preston, I think, a year ago or two years ago, shared a picture of a belty and then it went absolutely viral and suddenly everybody was talking about belties. And I guess at the moment, because everybody's more conscious of climate change and what they're eating and what they're rearing. And I think belties have been seen as a sort of more environmentally friendly choice, which I'm very excited about because it means there's more people going into the breed, which is just wonderful. And like my mum, um, she's vice president of the Belta Galley Council. And she's just, she's really passionate about just getting more people involved, particularly young handlers. Like she's really big on supporting the young generation. We've had a few young handlers days and just getting the, the next group ready to take on the breed, hopefully in the future, which has been great. Yeah, it's excellent. And I mean, we look at environment, just the environmental impact of farming, it's all over the world right now. It's all over the news, as, as you'll know, Claire, you'll be, you'll be covering it a lot. Um, but if in my head, if you can put an animal on a hill or in a rubbish ground and you can get protein out of that, it's got to be a no-brainer. You know, yeah. um, it, it absolutely has. Uh, when when you sort of moving on from the Belties, uh, Claire, when you left school, or maybe not when you left school, maybe when you were still at school, actually, you had an interest in just about everything. Um, but I think two things I remember talking to you last year was horse riding and, and athletics. Can you tell us a bit about them, maybe? <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, horse riding was a massive passion growing up. We, um, we had, again, talking about native castles, the Belties, they always had native horses too. And we had, um, when I was really young, we had well section A's and then, and my, my granny had a Highland pony and we actually we actually used to get them wild so my my mom was really passionate about breeding like really young wild ponies so we never had these you know you'd get people at shows and these perfect ponies and you'd always get us you were like the wild group and we'd always turn up with these wild sort of fell well ponies <laughs> it was just so much fun and and I had yeah I just was so lucky growing up with them and I had some new forest ponies so that's one of my favorite um favorite types they're really beautiful breed of horses Sadly, when I was in my third or fourth year at school, two of my ponies were poisoned and um, something we never got to the bottom of, like postmortems we did, and it was just really heartbreaking at the time because we could never work out what happened and they died of in close succession. And it sort of it just changed something in me. I, I just sort of lost a bit of my love for horses at that point because, you know, every morning and night, that's all I did. I rode all the time and, and it was like a big thing with my mum too and we'd always been on the show circuit and suddenly like things sort of, changed and I drifted away more to the castle side after that I think it was just too painful and um, I don't know if I told you that before <laughs> being a bit heavy here but um, it, was, it was just a really difficult time seeing that because you just when you've got a really good relationship with a horse that's really special so I've never I'm not really the same now I don't think long term in the future I'll ever go back to horses I actually just now prefer working with castle I think <laughs> castle are easier they're less temperamental highland pony yeah you're pretty set it's pretty fine but some of the nippy wee welshes and stuff like you're always on your toes so i think working with cattle is i can trust it a lot more <laughs> maybe called fail well because they're pretty well good at making you fail over um 
it's it's a tough time that mid teenage years for something to hit you hard, isn't it? Because it's it's an yeah. emotional time. There's a lot of changes going on, and uh, something like that's obviously going to hit hit you quite hard. Uh, I mean, the first thing that sprung to mind was some kind of rag work related thing, but nothing came back after the well, after the postmortem. That's quite strange. But you're right. We did. We checked everything that they yeah. checked. My mum, she was just absolutely driven mad by it because she wanted to know what happened to her lovely horse. But nothing came back in, but it, we just thought it was a poisoning. And it, it, I just remember, like, the, the one that lived was the Highland Pony Enzi, and she was in a drip for so long, and it was, like, touch and go with her. But my well Section B and my new forest, they, they both died, and they were the ones I was riding. So it was yeah. it was just awful, because you do. You just you love your animals so much. And I guess growing up with mum as a vet as well, like animal welfare was everything, and they were just so well looked after. Everything was so strict. I mean, it's, now we talk about paddock grazing and things for, for yeah. cattle. It was, I mean... We had everything, we'd all the electric fences, everything was rotated. So we were looking at things like trying to reduce laminitis and different things. Every we were just so careful with everybody, which made it, I think, harder because we didn't take any risks. But it's just one of these things you learn you learn from, but <laughs> a, a family before their time, eh? <laughs> well ahead with the paddock grazings and stuff like that. Um so what about athletics? So that yeah, was- so that was, I mean, that sort of happened around the same time as the horses too. So when I was around I think it was 13 when I was uh, 12 or 13 and I must have been doing athletics and um, that the school I was at in air it was sort of the summer season was when you did athletics and there, there was a coach in air who'd sort of seen that I was all right at sprinting and he, <laughs> and um, I you know it wasn't sprinting I was okay at sprinting it was hurdling he thought I was had quite a good technique a very basic technique but he thought I was quite good and had a bit of promise so he approached me and said if you'd like to come down and join our squad at some point and like one of my best friends, Aaron, he, he was a really good herd at the time. So him and I sort of teamed up and we proposed it to our parents because we were quite young. And we were like, we sort of put it, put the case to them why we should train this many times a week. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't know why we felt the parents would say no, but we, we put it like a business case. And um, so him and I used to go after school like three or four times a week, so a few times in the week and the weekend. And it sort of built from there. And we ended up, um, Aaron too, like we, we got to quite high level in athletics and when I went off to uni I continued training I joined the athletic club Edinburgh Uni Athletic Club which was just amazing made so many amazing friends but I was still my coach um, Sandy Ewan would come through and train with me all the way from air he'd come through to Edinburgh like I'd say once every two weeks even a month and and sort of look at look after my training and yeah I, I can continued competing like for Scotland and in various different levels until gosh until I was maybe 26 I think 26 27 so not that long ago <laughs> so it was a really huge part of my life doing athletics and it does it means like you're not able to drink well you know I chose not to the amount of work that I was doing so like you sort of make a lot of sacrifices because you're so committed to it and it takes up your weekends and like you're not really having the same sort of life as some of your friends as well but I loved it at the time so and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it sounds like you're a very committed coach as well coming over yeah. Um, I'm positive there's a video somewhere if there's not a video it definitely happened we were doing hurdles for the first time at school and uh, let's just say I wasn't athletic and uh, I hadn't watched the hurdles in the Olympics so I wasn't really sure what happened so I, I sort of jumped in like a forward roll to go past the hurdles the first time <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I say there's a video out there let's hope there's not but um, yeah you mentioned a couple of uh, mentioned uni a couple of times now Claire um I mentioned how good the clubs were in that and I mean clubs and sororities or whatever the fancy word is and all that it, it is so good you know you, you meet so many folk and it's brilliant uh, but could you tell us about what you studied at uni and maybe some of the clubs you were involved in if there was some of that as well yes yeah, so, um so I went off to uni at 17 and I was very young I was 17 for most of my first year I do I'll, I'll never sort of let that go <laughs> But I did um, international relations. I sort of did uh, an MA on in international relations and a lot of that sort of touched international politics. And yeah, I did that for four years. Um, it was an amazing course. It was very theory heavy and I'm more of a practical person, but it went well. I, I got my 2-1 in it, but um, I, I definitely prefer working to the, yeah, to the academic side at university. It was, but you know what? It was a fantastic course. And the reason I applied was... I was so interested in modern studies and what was happening in the world and I, I just sort of got a thirst for knowledge and I kind of want to know too much all the time and sometimes I've got to sort of set myself sort of goals that you can't learn everything and I think at that, at that point there was just it was African politics that was like my big interest and that's what I specialized in I did my dissertation in that that was sort of where I sort of saw myself 
moving towards. So it was completely different to what I'm doing now, completely different to journalism, but I, I really love international politics and I loved Af African politics. But at uni, as well as doing my athletics, um, my first week I had these lovely flatmates um, in, in halls. And I remember they were like, um, and I was like super sporty and everything. And I, I wouldn't say they're not sporty, but they maybe weren't quite as sporty as me. And they said, oh, we're actually going to try the ballroom dancing social. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I sort of made fun of it. And I was like, whatever, I'll come with you for a laugh. So I went along with them because I, I didn't see myself as very graceful. I was like throwing shot putt and jumping over hurdles and doing weight training. I was like, the last thing you see me doing was waltzing. And I went along and it was me that loved it like all the fat mates stopped going and I loved it and I went along on my own and ended up meeting my best friend who became my dance partner Dan and still is my best friend and we still dance together when we can and um yeah we trained <laughs> say training we we danced three to four times a week and we had a lovely lovely teacher at uni as well and I remember it was amazing it was one of the best things I could ever have done at university and I just loved it. I've always loved music and yeah, and it's a skill that I'll never, I'll never lose. Well, hopefully I'm maybe not as, <laughs> I'm not as nifty as I used to be, but it's just something, yeah, I'm hoping actually to get back to Borum and Latin dancing at the end of the summer because um, my best friend Dan, so he, he's currently, he's working in Africa with the civil service, but he's moving back. He's doing a master's in Glasgow. So the plan is maybe to take it up again. If I've got time, that's the plan because it was just, it was an amazing experience. <laughs> Brilliant. We'll be seeing you alongside the Katrinas and Antons and Strictly soon enough. I'm not that good. <laughs> um, so that that was in, your your course was in political affairs. Um, I take it, and I and well, I know actually, uh, you have some opinions on on Brexit and stuff. And I mean, Brexit is arguably the biggest thing to hit the news ever, and certainly in my lifetime, and and it's somehow been overshadowed by this uh, lovely little disease that we know of very well these days. <laughs> Um, could you tell us a bit about Brexit and you don't have to go into too much detail or go in as much as you want and maybe its impact on the farming industry and how it could hit it? Yeah, and actually, you know, the vote in itself, I mean, I remember 2016, we just actually passed, I think it was last week, it was, was it not, five years since the vote and I, w I was working at the BBC at the time on the election and I remember, like, I remember, I think, I'm sure it coincided with the Highland Show, I think it did, but I remember... You know, we, we did the overnight program, and I remember waking up um, at whatever stage it was at, and you know, but it happened. But it happened because we just hadn't, we just, no one really never sunk in. We just didn't think, it, you know, it was a, re a reality. The polls didn't really seem to show, you know, what happened in reality. And then I remember I, I sort of I left the BBC maybe a year after that, and I was like, well, farming is going to be the industry that's really going to be impacted. If you think about, you know, the amount of money that comes support for the common agricultural policy a third of funding from the eu by this huge body comes to, to to farming so i was like well of all industries farming's going to feel it the most and at that point i didn't feel farming was in the news that often and i remember i just by chance it was again around the highland show a job at scottish farmer came up and i was like that is like fate that i i could sort of join the scottish farmer and report exclusively on what's going to happen in the build-up to brexit with, with farming and then if we look at sort of what happened i mean I think the big concern was going to be if there was a no deal. I think originally that was like, well, that was all the headlines. I think we saw that for about a year, wasn't it? You know, it would be catastrophic. I mean, the National Farming Union was coming out and saying that if there was a no deal. I think somebody predicted like, a, you know, half, half of our businesses would, would go out of business. Like it was a lot of, I wouldn't say scaremongering, but there was a lot of panic in the industry. And obviously when they signed the deal at sort of the 11th hour, you know, we only had a matter of days to prepare ourselves for the changes at the border and all the health checks and certificates. And, you know, yes, they struck a deal, but it was anything other than, you know, anything but, a fr you know, a friction free. It was, if anything, it was just full friction that we've had. And, you know, for, for months, it wasn't just the teething problems that the UK government quite, you know, I think that made a lot of people quite cross saying you know it's just teething problems they'll be sorted soon well it wasn't teething problems I mean this has evolved into like fundamental flaws in the system there's been a lot of issues around Brexit and I think one of the one of the big things affected some of the businesses I spoke to was groupage so a lot of your smaller businesses would be able to combine all their goods to send over the, over to Europe but suddenly you couldn't do that everything had to be individually going over so no one could no one could afford that so nobody could share those business costs so a lot of companies just stopped exporting to Europe. So that was a big problem. And then at the moment, um, we've had the recent deal um, discussions with Australia. So people are quite, uh, you know, they're concerned about that. 
maybe they're not as concerned as they were about the US deal, but you know, does it set a precedent for future trade deals? What, what does that mean? And they talk about the sort of 15 year transition for, for farmers until they have, you know, tariff free, quota free access to, to the UK, but it's just hard to know you know, will our farmers be sort of swamped by the sort of the huge scale farming that they have in Australia? And there's lots of amazing Australian farmers. Not everybody uses hormones. Again, that's another sort of media thing. There's been a lot of talk about hormones and, you know, 40% of Australian um, beef uses hormones. But then there's a lot of chemicals that are banned here that they do use. And I think, you know, that, that's still a lot of beef, that 60% that could come here and whether they'll see that as a viable, strong market. We just don't know yet, but it is, it's a real concern especially for your your beef and sheep farmers I think but but obviously a lot of this is still to play out but yeah. <laughs> do, do you see a future for farming in the UK as we currently know it? Do I say a future? Yeah. Totally I think you know farmers are incredibly resilient I mean we've seen that with the pandemic I mean yeah the pandemic hasn't been as hard for all farming businesses it's actually been one of the industries that's been relatively unscathed of course hospitality of course agritourism there, there there's parts of it that have been affected hugely with the close the closing down of the food services sector but I do think a lot of farms have coped and we have seen a rise in demand for meat and you know it sent, sent the prices up as well so people have been you know they've been in a more positive position than they've been for, for quite a wee while. But um, I think what will end up happening is people will have to think, you know, how do we diversify our businesses to make more money? I think a lot of farms are doing that. I mean, agri-tourism, I mean, mentioned earlier, I mean, it's an incredible industry. I mean, Caroline Miller, who um, runs Go Rural, she's been promoting so many agri-tourism businesses across Scotland who, in the last year, I mean, that's the sector that has been impacted, yet they've still been investing. They've still been putting on glamping barns or they've been doing lamathons online. They've been building up their social media and their profiles. So people are very much still investing in a positive future. And I think it is about sort of listening to your audience and what they're interested in and seeing demand for local produce and whether it's going to stay. I think the concern for me would be with trade deals, if, if it sort of slips into the food services sector where there's not the transparency and the labeling, you don't know what you're eating. It's different in supermarket shelves. You know, you can, you pick up something, not everybody does care where it's from, but you, you as a consumer, you have that choice. Whereas often you go to a restaurant or places, we don't always ask. And that is where your, your food can come in and sort of fill the gap. And, and that's maybe more of the concern. But I think farmers are, are really resilient. And it's the ones that want to survive and ones that want to do well. They're the ones that will keep going and they'll improve. And maybe the ones that are struggling, they probably possibly won't. And that's not always a bad thing either. And there's also a need for some people to give up farming and to pass it on to the next generation or to let somebody new and, you know, those of ideas to come in so it could it could actually in that sense it could be good in the future that's a really positive perspective actually yeah yeah no absolutely Ca caroline's done some fantastic things with go rural uh, i've just sort of always known about go rural since i was probably halfway through uni and yeah they're excellent those lamathons were fantastic i had a shot at them not through go rural and they're not easy <laughs> a lot of pressure there <laughs> um, yeah no absolutely uh, <laughs> this has been great I'm just picking your brains totally here and there's more information than I even thought there would be so it's fantastic <laughs> um, after, after uni Claire you, you moved on uh, to an NGO is that right or have I missed a part there yeah um, can you tell us a bit about that maybe also tell us what an NGO is a lot of people might not know exactly what that is that would be excellent <clears throat> yeah so when, when I was at uni like my one of my biggest things I told you was African politics and I was really lucky and um, I, I worked hard but I was really lucky that literally I, I graduated and I ended up in London working for a non-governmental organization the NGO which was Starfish and it was a, you know it was an aid charity and I was involved sort of in, in the office side of things and it was amazing and a really small team and um, you know we organized our fundraising events and you could and it was great because you were seeing the impact it was having different in different villages and in, in Africa and it was trying yeah it was it was great but the problem I had was that I I suddenly realized that the part of the charity work that I enjoyed was actually being out there I you know I've done various trips sort of growing up as well and I was kind of like me sitting in an office and sort of you know organizing events and raising money it wasn't really for me and that sort of pretty quickly I sort of was like maybe this side of NGOs wasn't for me it's more when I can see the deliverables and be part of that so I was like oh, I sort of moved away from that and that sort of at that point is when I sort of fell into the media and left the NGO side before and it's and it's still something you know 
I'd consider going back at maybe a different level or or something if there's a charity I was really passionate about I would do that but I think at that stage it kind of opened my eyes to maybe it wasn't the right thing for me sort of in a desk job working with a charity wasn't right. <laughs> I, I always feel finding something's not for you by doing it is the best way and not just assuming it's not absolutely sure. yeah. Yeah, so, so you're talking about getting into media there, it started at the Commonwealth, which is sickening to think is seven years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to tell us a bit about all that and how that all sort of came about, that'd be good. Yeah, so I came back from London in end of 2013. Um, and I was actually, I was living at home. My, my mum had um, two hip operations in quite quick succession. So I sort of moved back to sort of help out a little bit on the farm at that point. And I was sort of picking up little bits of work and work experience in radio stations and different things as I went and then a job opportunity came up with the Commonwealth Games approaching in July with the BBC it was to be a sports reporter traineeship and I was like well that sounds absolutely amazing at that point I was still doing all my athletics I was actually trying to get into the Commonwealth Games didn't get I didn't quite get <laughs> get the time but I was still trying and I was like well this sounds amazing imagine being there reporting on you know one of the biggest events to come to Glasgow so, and I just couldn't believe that I got in, I got down to the final four and then after my interview with the BBC, they called me like the next morning and told me I got it. And um, I started with them in July and it was meant to be, you were in two days a week for I think it was six weeks and it just wasn't enough. I mean, I was doing, it was unpaid and everything, but I remember just being like, I'll do anything, you know, while I'm here in the sports department, just any other jobs doing, whether it's weekend, radio work. And they sort of were like, okay, great, we've got a spare pair of hands. They sort of threw me into everything. So I ended up having the most fulfilling internship where I did. And I ended up getting a bit of paid work as well. And I was out interviewing athletes in the village and doing things. And it was great because it was so many different sports. I remember reporting on swimming and gymnastics. And like, I met like the, the, the British gymnastic team um, some of the, with the Scottish and the English parts. It was just so cool. I was meeting all these people and interviewing them and yeah, it, it was it was awesome. Met Matt Baker, who was <laughs> I was quite a fan of. Managed to get him to do. I actually signed him up for an interview with the BBC, so that was quite a proud moment. <laughs> but um, but that was great because I was there for about six six to eight weeks, and then when the Commonwealth Games, when it eventually moved on, it was back to sort of mainly sport. It's sort of mainly football, and I'm not interested in football. I remember doing some like radio bulletins and having to pronounce the names of the football players and everyone was sort of laughing at me in house all the guys I was working with and I was and they told me I was too seductive in the way I pronounced the names because I was still <laughs> slow in the way I was pronouncing them I was trying to get it so right they were like you can't be that seductive on air so I was like well this isn't good is it <laughs> so I think football wasn't maybe for me but I did work at it for a bit but then then there was a referendum that came up straight after the Commonwealth Games um so I ended up being sort of taken in. I, I was really like, I was not doorstepping, but I was like at the news team the whole time being like, is there any jobs coming up? I really want to work on a referendum. And I ended up working in a, a debate unit and I and I organised like the, the Great Hydro debate. And then oh, I can't remember how many pupils there were. It was 50,000 pupils or so. It was just something crazy that we had to interview all these people. Like, an amazing team. And I'm so friends with the, the people I started at the BBC with, like this core team. I'm so pally with them. And we organised all these young people because the 16 and 17 year olds had just been given the vote. So it was just, you know, that was so exciting for me because for a young person to be so actively involved in sort of the democratic process. So that was like one of the absolute sort of highlights for me of seeing them in action. But then it was also one of my sort of low lights because at that point, you know, working on a referendum is very divisive. But referendums are always divisive. You've always got two sides. And I did find it was really difficult when you speak to a 16 year old girl who was like, well, I'm being bullied because... I'm, I'm voting no and they're telling me I'm not really Scottish. I got all these stories as well and you thought all these young people that are, you know, infighting over, over these divisive issues. So I think that was the first time I was like, well, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing sort of seeing all these young people, you know, really struggling on this? And that, that I found very difficult. And even now, uh, and when I talk about referendums or whether it was Brexit or like if we're going to have India F2, which obviously we might talk about, you know, it's always been sort of put out there always worries me that it sort of divides people and that's something I, I that was the first time I ever came across that like really dramatically in my work at that point. <laughs> Do you know that that's a shame because you know I was one of those 16 17 year olds really excited to be involved and we, we, we spoke about it at school and stuff and I always felt like both sides were like you would have the sort of general banter with your mates and stuff like, oh, why are you voting that or whatever, yeah, but like for the most part, it was it was pretty positive and you actually started to learn stuff and for a while I was really into politics. I mean, I barely know anything about it now, but it was, 
I, it's a shame that that was happening. I mean, it's always going to happen, isn't it? Um, but but you've mentioned Dundee Ref too, so so let's maybe just jump onto it. Do you do you think? Maybe I shouldn't shouldn't say. Do I think you think it's happening? But do you, what do you think it could bring if it does happen? I mean, it's definitely <laughs> happening. I'm sure they said what within the first half of the next term. I mean, that it was on the, the you know the manifesto ticket. I mean that it was going to happen. People were you know both folks S and P for a referendum, so people knew that was going to happen. And whether or not it's is allowed, and whether or not they'll bypass Westminster, we, you know, there's going to be all sorts of drama coming up from that. And um, if you're asking, are you ask my opinion of it. Uh, well, I, I know you won't give your opinion on it. But I'm allowed won't. to now. I'm allowed to give my opinion. Oh, okay, perfect. Then, yeah, if I throw in your opinion. Excellent. Yeah. But if I give a different opinion to some people, I guess I think the sort of opinion I've held since the start of the year, when I when I've sort of been able to write more opinion pieces of my other line of work now, is like we're still coming off a referendum. It's our referendum we're coming out of a pandemic, and like, you know there is there is a great lot of, you know, we're very unsettled as a country. And I do, even just talking my last experience from the hydro debate, it does worry me having such division at this time. And I think no matter what, it's going to pull people apart. There's going to be protests, it's going to be upset, there's going to be families that are challenged at this time. And I think people haven't seen their families for over a year and suddenly families are going to be infighting. And I think, and that is what we definitely saw. And I, when I worked at the BBC for the Brexit referendum and that one, we saw families and friends falling out and it, it was just really heartbreaking to see so I feel like if there's a you know I think in a few years if there's still an appetite and absolutely there, there should definitely be one I think that would I would absolutely if that's what the will of people was great I just I worry about the timing but then who knows where we'll be in a couple of years but it's more of a timing issue for me at the moment <laughs> well if if if, a, if the vote is cast and it's a yes and and, and independence does happen how do you think that will impact farming? I assume a big part of that's transport infrastructure and getting by and all that, getting through borders and stuff. What do you think on that? Oh, yeah. Well, what do I think on that? I'm. Do I think we're going to get straight back into the EU? No. Do I think we're going to have, you know, massive debt? Yes. Do I think we're going to have the same border issues, but worse? Probably. Uh, I think you're going to find a lot of people leaving their jobs um, and, and moving away. I think we're going to, I mean... It's our biggest market. I mean, like seventy percent of our lamb, or seventy percent of all our exports go to you know go part of our single market into the UK. So, I mean, how is that going to work out? I just I just can't even imagine it for farming. And and we're just you know our supply chains like we earlier and um, we talked about the haulage industry as well. You know, everything is so you know there's so much of the supply chain that's interlinked across the UK in farming that we don't always realise. I think it's going to cause disruption that people can't even begin to imagine and I'm sure it'll be there I think it'd probably be an easier relationship in some ways than it might be you know forging a deal with the whole of Europe than with in between England and Scotland and I think it, maybe that would be a bit better but it's just hard to even imagine the disruption it's going to cause to the farming industry and if we don't have joint standards I mean it's not going to be an even playing field competitively speaking so if suddenly, you know, so one of the really contentious issues is genetic um, editing, genetic modification as well. So gene editing is being explored by Westminster. It's an absolute no-no in the Scottish government. There's a review happening in the EU. So I think Scotland is sort of, at the moment, they're siding with what the EU are going to say on this. And imagine if suddenly we're using gene editing in England and in Scotland we're not, and that maybe ends up being an advantage to English farmers and suddenly we're at a disadvantage competitively. So I think that's a concern too, that we're gonna we're not gonna match up. But yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Well. Do you know it, it's it's an argument for another day. And some people listen to this and think, Wallace, what are you talking about? But I am for for the most part, I'm for GMO. Um and I would actually love to have someone working on gene manipulation on the podcast. It's really interesting to talk about and show that I know nothing about it. Uh, but yeah, no, I really, I really think there's a lot of potential there. It's got to be done correctly. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. It's quite interesting to see how how you think it impacts it all. Um, throughout, Claire, you've mentioned the Scottish farmer a couple of times, and I mentioned it at the start. Uh, you mentioned that you got, you offered an interview, I think it was, uh, at the Highland Show, uh, and you've been there for, for a while now. Could you tell us just a bit about the Scottish farmer, maybe what a, a day in the life of Claire Taylor is at the Scottish farmer, even though it's probably different now? But uh, <laughs> yes. A day in what it used to be like in the Scottish farmer, yeah. It's probably so more I... entertaining, yeah. <laughs> 
No, I joined in August 2017. So yeah, by the time this comes out, I'll have been there over four years, which is just mad when I think about it. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's a magazine that comes out. It's a weekly magazine and we've got sort of core news and business team. We've got a lifestyle section as well. And, um, you know, it's just, it's an absolute... I don't know how to really sum up the Scottish farmer. You know, we're, we're telling the stories of the farming industry and we try, I mean, the business team are fantastic. They do amazing features across the country, whether it's before sales or not. And they're, they're, and they, they're telling the stories of different generations of farmers and what they've been doing. And so that's what the business do. And they're also at the sales and at the show reports too. And then as news, it's been mainly Brexit. We've been covering for the last, gosh, since I've been there, there's been a lot on Brexit. There's been a lot in terms of, you know, whether it's been the climate change is, is big. So a lot of it has been covering how farmers are changing their practices to be more environmentally friendly, more nature friendly. So it's been sort of, you know, trying to keep ahead of the trend in, in farming stories. And actually what I love about the Scottish farmer <coughs> is that often, you know, our story will we'll break a story and then mainstream media will jump on top of it. And when I was at the BBC, I used to find that, you know, I would we'd get our stories from the Scottish farmer because you do, you, you've got this unique readership, this unique audience that are all, and we do, we reach so many homes throughout Scotland, which is just amazing. And that sort of intimacy in the work is what I love, is that I just got to know so many people that I'm out in the field with, <laughs> out in the field, that I'm, you know, I, whether I'm up in Orkney or I'm over in Skye or Lewis and Harris and places. So if I'm ever away somewhere, I know people in pockets all across the country. And it's just such a great network to work in. And people pick up the phone. It takes a while to sort of build up your profile and people know you. But I do, I get phone calls from people. They'll know what sort of issues I'm quite passionate about. Um, and like one of the things I, I write quite a lot about are the white-tailed eagles. And farmers know this, I'm always sort of fighting their cause on it. So they'll pick up the phone and be like, have you seen this? Like, we'd really like you to sort of raise awareness has been happening. And, and I think that's so amazing that we can do that. Because often the papers, you don't, you're not able to sort of lobby in a sense, but the Scottish farmer is great because it can bring sort of awareness to certain causes and things that are going on and really, really put pressure on whether it's politicians. And the Scottish government, they, they I remember when Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing was in, I know he had the Scottish farmer on his desk every Friday. I remember him telling me that. So he was always reading it and you hear people talking about it in Parliament. So rural MSPs are really engaged. Loads that I speak to quite regularly that are just so engaging and you can, and if there's been problems, I sometimes can pick up the phone and speak to somebody directly on behalf of a farmer. And it's like, you, it's something that sort of level of personal relationship you don't get in mainstream media. Like I didn't get that at the BBC and it's something I struggled with. Whereas I, I do like the fact that I've got friends. It's not, I'm not just a journalist. I feel like when I turn up to things, I'm never embarrassed to say I'm a journalist or sometimes I am. Whereas just because people have sort of stereotypes of journalists, whereas I think in farming, your reputation is different because they know that you're all supporting the industry. You're all there to promote it in the best light possible. And I do think the Scottish farmer, they absolutely will defend the industry over everything. And sometimes we'll go really far on it as well. Like where some papers would shy away, we don't shy away. And that's something I'm very proud of. My boss, Ken Fletcher, is a bit, he's very like that too. And him and I are very different and we clash over so many things. And that's what makes working with him really good. Cause you just, you'll just be like, do it, just go and do it. I want it like, you just gives me that freedom and autonomy. And again, that's something you don't always get. So it's just been great. <laughs> And it's interesting you said MSPs, the farmer on the table and stuff like that. Is it mostly farmers reading it? Most farmers that read it. Yeah, I'd say farmers, farmers. It's just people working in agriculture more generally. There's loads of, loads of horse. Uh, I'd say like a third of our readers are from horses, from the horse industry as well. So it's a huge variety. Again, it could be like hauliers. It could be the contractors. Like there's so many that read it. A lot of politicians will read it, civil service, civil servants too. And it's good because you want to get it to the farmers, but you also want to get it to the people in power that are making decisions. So that's something, is, that's our, I'd say that's more news's role. We want to make sure there's an issue, we'll drive it. And sometimes our stuff doesn't always balance. Like I know like sometimes business will be writing a story about a top price top selling for like hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And I'll be writing an article in news being like, well, you know, farmers in the West Coast are really struggling for sheep prices and they're really struggling to make a living. And people are saying, well, how can you write that when you've got sheep selling for this? And I'm sort of in a battle because I'm like, well, that isn't the reality for a lot of sheep farmers. It's fantastic and it gives people a goal and you have in the, the breed side and sort of that profile, people really look up to that and they aim for that, but it's not the reality. And sometimes I'll have a politician that will say to me, oh, you, you know, you're talking about LFAS funding and more money for farmers yet you just shown in the in the paper that they're earning this much money and it's trying to say to politicians that isn't the full story and I think we're quite good in news that sometimes 
you know, making sure that side of the story gets out too. So it's like a good balance there. And I mean, just, just that example you've given, it, it, it's excellent for those that can get into that position, but it, it's so not the case. I can't <laughs> stress that enough. I know you've said it, but, but mind that the, the Texel top that was sold was on BBC News, it was on Breakfast and stuff like that. And suddenly everyone's like, oh, you know, farmers are multi-millionaires, all of them. <laughs> all farmers buy like race rovers and like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it wouldn't be news. It wouldn't be on Breakfast if everyone done it. Yeah, it would be for two days and then that'd be it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, just you mentioned the, the white-tailed eagles there. Could you just tell us a bit about that then, Claire? <laughs> I, can't remember, I can't remember all my dates from it, but I mean, we, <laughs> many, many years ago, we had white-tailed eagles and they were sort of driven to extinction by, by humans. And they were reintroduced, oh, I can't remember how long ago, whether it was 30 years ago, maybe in, maybe in the 70s or 80s they were introduced. But the thing about white-tailed eagles, they are, they're top of the food chain. I mean, these things, you know, two and a half meter wingspan, we, you know, these are absolutely majestic birds. So they were introduced and obviously they're, they're a tourist draw. I mean, it's quite incredible to see one of these, these birds of prey. But part of the problem has been, you know, what are they preying on? And... It was found, you know, traditionally a lot of our, a lot of these white-tailed eagles do um, like fish. So in certain areas they would have fish or they might have rabbits or different things. But I think over the last few years, there's been a, things like rabbits, there's been areas that have sort of, there's been a lot, there's been a lack of other things for these birds to eat. And a lot of them, depending on the cold winter as well, you know, they've had to find, turn to different sources of food. And in certain parts of the West Coast and sort of Mull and Sky and places, there has been really upsetting reports of these birds preying on on flocks of sheep, and it has been pretty horrendous. I mean, it's been some of the farmers who are devastated by the impact of these birds, and it is totally crushing for farmers. You know, going out and finding finding bits of their lamb, and and it's all for sort of the mental side of it, not just the financial. It's the mental side, the emotional side of it all. Of it. And you know, some of these these flocks or you know these groups can go back generations of bloodlines as well that they're losing and and also you know hefted flocks in parts of the west coast you know they're removing some of the hefted flocks and you can't they're having to then buy in buy in sheep that aren't hefted to the to the in the land either so that sort of changes the pattern for that farmer so there's been like real concern of that and Often, I think it's these juvenile. I think it's the, I think it's at the age of seven. I mean, again, that might be wrong where, where they can first start breeding. So you can get a pair moving to an area, and if they have a chick, I mean, they just have to have so much prey for them to eat. And that is when 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 you get a breeding pair moving in, that is a real concern. There's been sort of active groups across Scotland that have sort of done partnerships where they're working with NFU Scotland and Nature Scott and RSPB, and they're sort of trying to trial different ways to reduce the damage and the impact and it's like farmers using things like scarers or they're doing diversionary feeding like bringing fish in and a lot of these things do work but a lot of them don't work so there's been some farms that be really positive and some have been negative I often hear from the negative ones of course as a journalist and um a lot of farmers are sort of at their wits end I mean they just they you know they're totally at their wits end because they are saying well I don't know about my son or daughter to take over the farm because you know, I they they're seeing how devastating this is having on ours and our mental health. They're they're going to leave, so we're going to see families moving out of areas or selling up their sheep, or often some farms I know they've gone into um, trees instead, or they've sold up for for trees because they're like, well, what's the point if we're you know this having such a dent in our income and our in, in our livelihood? So I think it's I think a lot needs to be done to sort of improve the situation. But when it comes to you know, it's not a case that you can't just say a license to shoot the birds. That's not going to happen. It's got to be a case of can we catch them and move them to another location? Can we like fell some of the, the trees and the nests so then encourage them to move further away? So they are talking about different things yet, but um, yeah, we're still a long way off the solution on the white tailed eagles. And I guess there's, there's some that have just been spotted in Lot Lomond. So I think everyone's a little bit nervous about that at the moment. And it's an interesting one that the birds attacking lambs and stuff like that. There's loads of different sea eagles. Sea eagles are a big one, um, sort of nail and that sort of thing. Uh, but it, it was it was interesting you said that you know it is a financial impact, but it's it's more so a mental health impact. The odd time it's mainly the odd crow or seagulls on our farm. Uh, the time when you go out and you pick up a lamb that's no longer got a tongue or an eye or whatever. Never have I thought, oh, that's however much quid we're missing out on 
that's never what it's going to go to us. Uh, and I think it, it's good that you're saying that, you know, people are realising that, no, OK, there is a financial impact, but it's definitely the back burner, I thought. Um, has, has COVID, well, I know it has really, COVID will have impacted your job hugely. What has it done, Claire? Yeah, so, gosh, you know, it was only the, the um, well, by the time this comes out, it's going to be September, but now we're talking it's June. But um, so this would have been, if we go back to June, it was the first time I met out and met a farmer for an in-person feature in 60 months. 60 months. That, I mean, that is a huge amount of time I've even been at the Scottish Farmer. So like in March 2020, I mean, I sort of had my last shift in the office and I've not been back since. And yeah. everything's been from my desk. Like right now, in my, I've got a, I'm in my spare room in my new house. It's been fine. But there was a point where I was working in a three story flat in Glasgow. My partner was in the kitchen and I was in the living room and it was a nightmare because he was on calls all the time and I was on calls. Um, so that was very difficult. And it's also, you know, losing motivation because you're, you're wanting to sort of be out finding stories and speaking to people. There's not the, the same vibrance and things come on there's no conferences people aren't saying oh did you hear what happened here or this different minister said this there's, there's not that sort of thing that's a journalist like I get kicked from I love going to things and someone saying have you heard this Claire and I'm like Ooh. <laughs> and you know I then want to go and like look into it and do a few calls you don't get that everything is very forced and I'm not really good at that sort of thing I like more just bumping into people or you know I and it's, it's been very difficult because sometimes there's plenty of news going on like we're not struggling we have put out we've, ne we've never failed to put a paper out in this year and you know the industry the paper industry has been struggling this last year the Scottish farmer has done really well like we've been blown away our, our you know our pages have, have maintained the size of our pages you know our staff have been working like really hard we're all speaking over teams we all hate speaking over teams I'm sure everyone's the same we're all zoom calling all the time and just like your communications aren't as good. Like there's a there's a break of communications that we all we make mistakes here and there. But in general, people have worked harder than usual because you're trying to prove you didn't know how long you were going to be at home. So you're trying to be like, oh, you know, we're lucky to be home. We're going to really prove that we can work here. But then it's just gone on and on. You've sort of set a level of work of working that you're now trying to maintain. And I think a lot of people would probably relate to that. We've all, you know, we don't switch off. You like when I'm like it's now a Sunday night. I'll be working tonight and. I'll check my email at different times like you don't really switch off and I think that's been very hard whereas like even just going out this week so June to go I met with um, former politician John Scott MSP and it was just amazing I was there on his farm for two and a half hours like looking around his farm and it was just so exciting just being there and speaking to him and like hearing what's been going on in Ayrshire and different things from his perspective and he's like messaged me twice this week saying what you know it's so great as being there and I feel the same so I think that and that is why I love my job is those moments with people which I think it's been really really hard not having that not having some of the really big conferences I love it the NFU Scotland conference is a real highlight in the calendar for me like last year Quality Meet Scotland had their first red meat conference for the first time it was like you know the, the first ever conference in the February and I, I helped co-host um, co that with Alan Clark it was a really exciting time and suddenly They've not been able to have another one. And like Agnes Scott went online, I was involved with that too, but it's just not, it's not been the same. The Highland Show, the showcase has been fantastic. But again, it's just not the same as all being together. So yeah, I've struggled because I'm a sociable person and I don't do well in isolation. <laughs> and I don't do well at just chatting to my partner all day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. You know what, I'm the same. Not that I don't do well chatting to your partner. I've never seen too much. Um, I'm sure we get on great, but uh, you know, th there's that sort of battle there, isn't there? There's the, there's the, is it working at home or is it living at work? And yeah. and I think, especially in your your situation before in the flat, it probably was living at work. It's your living room, literally, you know. Yeah. Um, and people, I mean, there's that whole people make Glasgow thing. People make everything really. I mean, I'm a social person as well, and mm -hmm. I've in the job I'm in, I've only been in the office here and there. I'm not used to it. This is what I'm used to for my job, and and it's strange total difference and uh, you were saying you're in John Scott's farm there and how sort of good it was to get out and, and do that I mean I, I went out for a cafe uh, out to cafe with my gran and our friends and I've been telling everyone about it you know like it was such a big day and um, we had cake and everything uh, but yeah it's hit us all hard and it, it has been tough and I think it's good that we're still 
still sort of coming out of it at the minute and the Scottish farmers selling well, which is, I mean, that's obviously got to be a plus. But yeah. uh, during COVID, or maybe not specifically in a lockdown or anything like that, but certainly since COVID started, you've taken on another position with the, uh, uh, well, it's a newspaper this time, with the, with the Herald. Could you tell us a bit about that, Claire? Yeah, so I was in discussions with the Herald um, just before Christmas time and they they'd sort of, I think they'd, they'd put out a, uh, an email to all their readers um, asking for ideas for new columnists for the new year. And apparently a few people put my name in as an idea of a column, which I'm really flattered by. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't think I was going to say it's probably my mum, but she didn't she didn't read the world at that point. <laughs> um, so that was really exciting that that sort of come to their attention. And because we work for NewsQuest and part of that book, umbrella is the Scottish Farmer and Herald and Times, we're all part of the same group. So I didn't know the editor and I know people within it. So it was actually a lovely kind of easy conversation to have had. And, but they approached me and said, would you come on as a columnist for us? And they sort of said, it'd be great to have um, a rural angle, not just rural, they like me to talk about general politics as, as well. And um, it was the first time that I could have an opinion. And I am a very opinionated person, but I've never really been able to share my opinions. Not just in politics, but everything I'm opinion, opinionated about. And it's just been amazing to have a platform that I can do whatever I want with. And, you know, once a week, so every Tuesday it comes out. Um, at the moment, I'm actually looking to move to a Wednesday. But um, just to make it my life a little bit easier because I'm working weekends at the moment as well. But um, I, I'll write about a thousand words on anything I want to write about. And, and people keep saying, you know, do you not run out of content? I do not run out of content. There's so many amazing, interesting things, whether it's like, you know, a mental health piece I've done. I did a piece on India F2, actually, which caused a lot of backlash, a lot of confrontation. People have lots of opinions of that. I've noticed Herald readers are different Scottish farmer readers. Um, I could do it. And it's been great because a lot of people in farming that know I've got the column will approach me sometimes and say, like, we know you can't write this in Scottish farmer, but would you be keen to talk about it in your column? Because a lot of people can't do that. You know, a lot of organisations, they've got to be political. They can't start saying what they really think about government red tape and different things where I can. So I can be like, do you know what? Leave it with me. I, I'm sure I'll have plenty of opinions about it. And then I can have been working with different people in the industry too to sort of share ideas. And it's just been great to use it to sort of lobby really important issues in rural Scotland. And I think as well, like, you know, the Herald's a really urban readership. Like, I think they are. And, and I, when I pick up the paper, most people are talking about Nicholas Sturgeon and Boris Johnson. Everyone seems to be talking with them. And I'm sure that they are interesting, yeah. But it's, it's sometimes good just to have something totally different and to, and I always try and do, I don't tend to just run. I tend to try and put solutions and ideas and proposals and give people something to talk about. So I had a discussion over dinner as well. And, and I have found like, because I'm quite like a, a I, I like to think I'm quite fun and positive and silly. If you read my columns and didn't know me, Wallace, like I come across very serious and intense because unfortunately a lot of the issues I'm talking about are like really serious and intense because it's people's livelihoods at stake. So I feel like sometimes I'm like, this week's going to be a, it's not going to be a heavy week. And it's always a heavy week. There's always something big on climate change or there's something, you know, that's huge that's going on. And I just have to shine a light on it. So I feel sometimes, I feel like my partner, my mum's a bit like, it <laughs> just ease off. <laughs> but, um, but like, you don't know ever how long you're going to get an opportunity like that. You know, you never know where you're going to be working next or if you can, you know, if I'm in a job, you know, I maybe couldn't keep a column. So I think it's really important to me that I, I can really talk about lots of issues I care about and a lot of columnists just write about the weather or you know a new series on Netflix I'm not that kind of columnist <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you watching on Netflix at the minute that would be a good call for the next week Jerry Clarkson's farm I was in Prime. I'd just like to say this is not a, a an ad for I was in Prime or Netflix if you guys are listening and you want to sponsor the podcast obviously I'll say yes um <laughs> No, you said you were flattered about people uh, putting your, your name forward for that call. I'm sure it was very much deserved, but you, even if it was your your mum and your partner putting 78 in each, that's that's uh, <laughs> you know, it's deserved, I'm sure. It's, it's funny, uh, you talk, you've now got an opinion. It's just like you've just had this like jar full of opinions and suddenly that lid's been opened and it's like, here's the call. <laughs> well, I've always had ideas because like, I've always, I've always watched your documentaries and it's still one of my absolute things I'd, I'd love to look at doing documents especially investigative docs but and I've always kept a book of different ideas that I've wanted to pursue so it's been a bit like it's always been part of me anyway that's wanted to do that it's like more like an investigative heavier side it's just that I've never dropped into I did documentaries and like on a different side 
um, in BBC. So I've always sort of had those ideas and things I've wanted to sort of do. So it is just nice to, yeah. People, I just find it very weird that, I don't know yet, it's hard to know people's feedback. I mean, it's amazing when you write something and then suddenly your email the next day is like full of, like people, you you know, from across the country, I've had people from Shetland and places that have messaged me and be like, I really struck a chord of your column and thanks for shining a light on this. And it might just be one message, but oh my God, it makes, it just feels so good when someone acknowledges something. Because in general, as a journalist, like people either message you because they're angry or you just don't, you just don't hear back from anyone. Like, well, as you messaged me when, when we did your article, you couldn't have been nicer and, you know, nicer about it. But in general, you don't hear back from anyone. So getting feedback it's great because also when it's negative feedback or constructive, like you can change the way you write. And I think it's really important to get negative or constructive feedback too. And that's something I, I like. I try not to read all the comments from all the keyword warriors, but constructive feedback is good. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Structured feedback is good. There's a lot of keyboard warriors out there. Um, <laughs> I mean, you, you, did a, you did a two and a half page thing about me. I was hardly not going to message you. It's like the coolest thing ever. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and your sort of non-working time, uh, I see you do a fair chunk of stuff with Rhett, Claire. Can you tell us what, what that involves? <clears throat> yeah, so um, oh, I think it was 2018, I, I first sort of decided, well, I got contacted from someone from Rhett because I had been doing a talk with the Rural Youth Project and I happened to mention the Rural Highland Education Trust and there's a lady from Rhett there messaged me saying, you ever thought about being a volunteer? And I had thought about it, but I guess it's just one of those things, work so much going on in work, I'd not really sort of looked into and then um, I, in Glasgow at the time, so my Clyde region, I got in touch with the coordinator and yeah, did all the sort of met up with, with her and we, we talked about, you know, what, what would be involved. And ever since then, apart from the pandemic, I've been able to go out into schools and chat to sort of primary two, primary three, four pupils, which has been amazing. And there's, there's just nothing better than speaking to kids because kids, kids are just so honest and just ask you great things all the time and like and like you know they'll ask you why is milk white and not green and like they'll and things I don't know the answer to and I'm like wow like, I'm gonna go back and like look into these questions these kids have asked me and it's just and it's actually made me think differently about things like speaking to kids I'm talking about you know meat or dairy products and they'll be like oh my little brothers you know dairy intolerant and then like we'll have a conversation about what that's been like for their family and exploring things and that's it. And this is like a primary two talking to me about it. And I just think that is like amazing. These young kids are discussing food. So that is that is one of my absolute highlights. And I actually I actually went out and did my first rec talk last week at primary school at Ibrox, just next to <laughs> Ibrox Stadium. Okay. And it was outdoors, so we couldn't get indoors. And there was about 14 of them. And they were so excited when I turned up. And I didn't have the visual aids, I didn't have like the presentation. I couldn't do the usual I couldn't take in like strawberries and stuff you know like, in general I tend to take in not bribes the kids but I take in like <laughs> strawberries and chocolate and we'd be like oh <laughs> when I get when I get to certain points but they were just so great for a full hour I spoke for like 15 minutes because they were they were particularly young people and they just never stopped asking questions I mean like and they want to tell you all about what they think about farming and it just it was just great yeah I just I, I think I think over the last year has been hard and I think you know we've not been able to go out and that relationship with the public hasn't been there. I think with Highland Show, you get all the pupils going out. You know, they have hundreds of schools at the Highland Show are doing the wet experience. It's just fantastic. So I think, you know, it's yes, they've, they've had these sort of online tools that they give to teachers and they can do sort of Zoom learning with kids. But kids want to be out on a farm and they want to, you know, feel a cluster in the classroom. I take in a cluster and they like sort of try to milk the cow and stuff. I think you need that sort of hands on learning. And I think that has been really, really hard. And I, you know, they've had, you know, there's open days and now opening back up, people get onto farms. I think as soon as Rec can get out again, I think that's really important. It's it's amazing about what, you know, the questions the kids ask. I mean, I've got a degree in agriculture and a master's in food security and I barely answer anything they ask. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> and I mean, I've only actually done one in class thing way before, well, not way before COVID, but before COVID. And uh, it was maybe about an hour and a half I had. And it was the full time. It was questions. It was it was opinions and stuff. And this was primary school kids. And, and they were so pro-farming in Scotland as well. It was it was quite refreshing, actually, you know. <laughs> um, no, Rhett, Rhett's excellent. I mean, well, this is obviously coming out in September, but just last week in real time for you and I at the minute, uh, I got voted on as vice chair of the Ayrshire Committee. So um, ah. it's, it's something that I'm quite involved in now as well. And it's, it's brilliant. It was interesting. I just saw on your Twitter that you're involved and it's, it's good to ask and see, see what's going on. But 
Um, yeah, I mean, we've really, we've sort of, well, maybe we haven't covered even half of your life or even a portion of your life there, Claire, but we've certainly had a very interesting chat. Is there, is there anything you think of, well, not I've missed out, but we've not talked about, uh, talked about today? I don't think so. I think I've probably just gone on and on and on, so I don't think so. <laughs> no, not at all. I think we're sitting at about 58-ish minutes probably at the minute. Oh, that's um, good. Perfect, actually. <laughs> uh, but there is there is still two questions, and okay. I, out of interest, haven't looked at this post from last year just to see if you say the same thing. But uh, where do you see yourself in five years? And also, if you had any tips for folk coming into industry now, for you, that could be agriculture, journalism, <laughs> Olympic competing, whatever. <laughs> what, what would they be, you know, that sort of thing? <clears throat> Oh my goodness. So I'll do the, the easier question first, which is okay. while I think about what I want to do. Um, people coming in, I think it's about networking and speaking to people and not being like, yeah, I think putting a phone call out to somebody, there's a job that you want to do, you're interested in. Like, I love when people get in touch with me and they'll say, you know, I mean, it might not be to become a journalist, but they'll ask for help on something and like, people want to help. I think, you know, like I know myself, the amount of people that have helped me in my career in terms of internship, I mean, so many internships and things. So whenever somebody comes to me, I'm more than willing. So I think it's about having a phone call, having a coffee with somebody and getting an idea. And I think enthusiasm just means everything. When I used to, I remember I, I, I hired, and when I was at the BBC, I hired an election team. And I remember being given all these CVs and being like, yeah, you know, if you've got a master's in it, you know, I was looking at sort of academics and I was just like, it doesn't tell me, it doesn't tell me too much about people. I was like, I need to meet people in person and see if they're going to work well as a team. And somebody of enthusiasm and passion and energy and a good work ethic, my gosh, I mean, like, you're like pretty much 90% there. And so I always think that all these things are just really, really important. The other question, where do I see myself in five years' time? Um, oh my goodness, where do I see myself in five years time? I definitely will be in the industry. I definitely want to, I'm not leaving farming in rural. Like I just, whatever I end up doing, I want to make sure that ties in. It's really important to me and all the people I work with. And the, yeah, that's really important. I'd love at some point to try some documentaries. That's like really, that's really exciting for me. I don't know how that'll happen or if it'll work out, but I'd love to look at doing some docs at some point. But um, keeping up my journalism would be great, but I think it's more working within the industry and to what capacity, I don't know. But I do love writing. I like sort of being front facing and out there with people. I don't want to be in a desk the entire time. I like to get out and meet people. I'm not going to go into politics. <laughs> that was debated quite a lot. I think that's, um, I've had, had enough of, I get enough keyboard warriors working with the Herald and the Scottish Farm. I think politicians have a really hard time, <laughs> but um I don't think I'll work in politics, but I do, I, I'd still like to keep up an active interest within that in some respect. Lobbying, again, I've told you, is something I'm really interested in. So I'm giving you a really rubbish, loose answer, but I know farming, rural, I've always been really excited. I'd see documentaries, whether enough would be good enough to do that, I don't know, but that would be something I'd love. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe documentaries, you could do like a sort of a cowspiracy about the other side. Yeah, um, that would be good. <laughs> Uh, that's one of my that's one of my things in my little book <laughs> oh is it excellent excellent well um i look forward to that one what would you call that the, oh i do have a name for it no names come last and you get you get all the sort of objectives and the intro and everything down then you come up with the, the good catchy name <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite good to speak to an actual journalist because i mean I'm, i feel like i do journalism things but i'm in no way a journalist uh, I, i'm very much a let's think of a cool name first and then make something around it <laughs> Because you speak, you, you're very passionate about the way you write. What I've noticed of you is that you can write, you know, you'll speak to somebody and write straight away. Whereas like, I'm quite bad for sort of overthinking things and going away and, you know, I'll transcribe something and write it afterwards and I'll go back and I, you know, you, you, it comes across that you're writing as you're just really passionate. And you just, you just, and I love that about it. You sort of see, you feel your enthusiasm in the way you write and think sometimes when you're, when your journalism is too sort of controlled, you kind of lose that and you've never lost that. And that's something keep, that's very good. That's such a nice diplomatic way of saying I'm unprofessional. Eh? No, it's not you're unprofessional. I just think it's, I just feel like so many journalists are so boring. Like, I love writing, I love reading your stuff. Like, I, I want to read it. I think that's what's great. That's a good journalist. Yeah, I got all awkward for this sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, no, um, well, it's, it's been a pleasure having, not, having you on, Claire. Um, as, as, as we've said, uh, we've, we've not had you on this before, but we have done this before. And uh, 
yeah, I hope anyone who's listening, um, if, if you've enjoyed Claire's story or maybe you want to sort of follow Claire from now on, um, could you tell us maybe the, the names of, of the, the column and the Herald, Claire? Is that how it works? Or well, it's just, well, by the time this comes out, it should be a Wednesday morning. I'm in the Herald. Okay. It's normally page 16, I think it is, 14 or 16. I get it. There's a big picture of me there in the Herald. But um, <laughs> but yeah, on like on Twitter as well. I'm, I'm, sl- I'm active on Twitter. I've been saying to Wallace, my Twitter followers are quite low compared to most columnists, but I'm getting there. I'm trying to get better at sharing stuff. <laughs> oh, not at all. Well, what is your Twitter so folk can follow? I think it's CJ Taylor Night. Hold on, how unprofessional of me! I should know what my Twitter. <laughs> Not uh, at all. It's CJ Taylor ninety two. <laughs> Grand. Well, um, make sure to go follow Claire there, and uh, yeah, if you haven't followed myself, jump and follow them, and hopefully, I mean, this is sort of I've been I've scheduled a lot of podcasts, and this is the last one in the big scheduling block at the minute. So, um, I don't know who's next, uh, uh, but if if you want to come along and, and give me some ideas. Because I've had, well, Claire's the 18, 18 fantastic folk on. I've got much more interesting stories myself. And uh, just trying to find more great folk is easy in some ways, but also quite difficult. So if you have any ideas or even yourself, Claire, if you have anyone, just, just let us know. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs>